Zagato was a coach builder and very much specialized in aluminum, handmade, low production, and really worked on making cars lighter, more aerodynamic. They did small engine tweaking. It was mainly body manufacturing, so they would actually take a typical Topolino body, take it off the chassis, and then build an entirely new aerodynamic, lightweight, nimble car to go racing. I've really kind of focused on the Zagatos. I love the aspect of handmade. I love the aluminum work. I love that every one of them is unique. They did a series of eight cars. If they did a series of even 100 cars, every car was unique and every car was handmade. And so I've really been taken by that. I think the Zagatos are beautiful from every angle. They're very purposeful designs. They're not over-designed, very simple. The aerodynamic necessity that Zagato was going for for the competitiveness also led to its simple elegance that stands the test of time as far as design goes. My name's Scott Gautier, and we were driving a uh, 1949 Topolino. It's a Zagato-bodied car. It's actually made by Fiat, but it's a modified Topolino, essentially. Typically, a Topolino was kind of the workhorse of Italy. It was comparable to the VW Bug in Germany. Very much a utilitarian car. It was used for delivery trucks. It was used for family cars. It was available in a two-door. It was available in a four-door. So it was really the workhorse of Italy at the time. The Topolino was a really good privateer project. Zagato would either have a factory come to them and say, look, we want to build a racing version of a car, but we don't have the budget, so we want to do a series of 20 of these cars. The other way was Zagato would actually have privateers take the car to the factory and say, look, I want you to build me a car. So it wasn't uncommon if you smashed up your Topolino and you had a little bit of money, you would take it over to Zagato and say, build me a car. And since Topolino was out there, they did do a series of eight of the 750 MMs. Typically, what they would do was not to this degree. This was more done as a production series where Fiat and Zagato worked together to try to come up with a racing series car. Of this particular version, the MM, there were eight made. And this is the only known surviving MM. I've always loved working with my hands, and that's why it translated into the cars too. I've always been a junk artist. That's just always how my mind works and always how my hand works. So when I was 16 years old, I got a job in a jewelry store. My family wasn't in it or anything. I got a job actually as a janitor. When I went to college, I got a job in a jewelry store, and that was the first time I actually saw jewelry being made. I'm like, wow, this is up my alley. This is something I'd love to do. The process of learning about the handmade cars and handmaking jewelry, which is kind of unique in the jewelry world, I think there was just a really nice blend there. All day long I would work on jewelry and then it would be really nice to go down and work on something large scale and step back and so it was really kind of a therapeutic hobby. Once I did that process, I never sent another restoration out. We've done everything in-house. Restoring cars I think is one of the joys of owning a car, taking something that maybe some pieces are missing, one blinker you have but you don't have the other and you can't find it anymore so we actually have the ability to fabricate it, make it. I do my own castings, we do all kinds of crazy things. Because of the world I'm in, nothing really scares us. You just can't look at it as too serious of a thing. It's just metal and it's paint and it's forming and it's fabrication and so those are all things I enjoy doing. As soon as I got the car, that was when I decided I'm going to do my own restoration. I thought if I can make jewelry, I should be able to make a, a Zagato bodied car. Not make it, but certainly restore it. We had just a great time learning. We all learned together. Luckily, the car was beautiful in that everything was there. It was all in boxes, but every little bit and piece and everything we needed was there for the car. And the body was in great shape, so we didn't have a lot of body work to do at the time, which was probably kind of helpful.
it's a wonderful feeling. I mean, I, I love driving them. This car, more so than any other car I have in my museum, it's like a smile mobile. I mean, I drive it down the street, and no matter who, it just brings smiles to people's faces. And that's a pleasure to be part of, and obviously knowing the history, you know, knowing that it was a race car, that it was a Mill Amelia car. Actually, it was given the Mill Amelia Award at Pebble Beach the year that I featured it there. They pick one car, the most significant Mill Amelia car that they want to have back in the Mill Amelia, and it was honored with that as well. I don't know if I'd take this one to the Mill Amelia. Maybe, though. A thousand miles is a long way in that little car. <laughs> certainly could end up there. It wouldn't surprise me if at some point it did. Not only is it really fun to share them, because first of all, I'm not the first owner, I'm not the second owner, I'm not going to be the last owner. I'm just part of this car's history. This car had other paint jobs before me, other races before me, I've done shows with it, I've done events with it, but I'm just part of its history and the car will live on longer than I will. And that's one of my favorite things about finding cars that are almost gone and restoring them is that I'm not only becoming part of the history, but I'm extending that history to someone else. So it's really fun to share them and I've had some great, great experiences. So just having it out there, you just learn so many interesting things. Thank you.